Okay, so this talk will be about uh, the algebra of observables in Gaussian normal space-time coordinates. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is uh, observable algebras in general relativity, here uh, constructed in a certain special way using geodesics uh, to locate uh, the points where we want to evaluate some physical fields. And uh, we will do this in two ways. Uh, first, we will recall some results on how to do this uh, using uh, spatial geodesics, so geodesics which are uh, uh, geodesics with respect to the spatial metric in some uh, constant time hypersurface. And then uh, later we will see how to uh, upgrade this condition uh, such that these geodesics are actually space-time geodesics and uh, we will see uh, the changes uh, that arise from that. Uh, the results uh, which we will discuss in this talk, uh, they are uh, published in the uh, paper that you see below which has uh, appeared in uh, JHEP by now. Okay, so let me give you a brief uh, motivation for this research. First of all, we are interested in uh, observables uh, for general relativity. Now that has a kind of multitude of reasons. Um, first of all, at the classical level, uh, they enter in the canonical formalism. Uh, there, these observables are essentially uh, phase-based functions which Poisson commute with the constraints of your theory, so they are gauge-invariant objects in this sense. And there, especially in the Hamiltonian formalism, we are interested in an algebra of observables, so we want to compute the Poisson bracket between two observables, O1 and uh, O2, and see whether that closes in some sense or it has some nice structure. Now it is important that this has some nice structure because later we are interested in quantum gravity, and in quantum gravity we want to promote this Poisson bracket to a commutator on a Hilbert space so that these O's become operators and uh, the the uh, commutator satisfies the uh, relations that the Poisson brackets tell you. Now, uh, in there, especially in quantum gravity, uh, you want these, uh, this algebra to be sufficiently simple so that you are even uh, able to find such a representation. Now, <clears throat> uh, there is also a certain relevance of this for ADS-CFT. Of course, ADS-CFT is a, a proposal for a theory of quantum gravity in itself. However, this specific topic of observables uh, also uh, arises there uh, when you're trying to construct a particular dictionary. So what one uh, tries to do in ADS-CFT is one tries to construct a like, concrete dictionary between uh, operators uh, in the conformal field theory which are on the boundary of this uh, ADS space depicted in the lower right corner here, and you try to match them with some fields in the bulk. So, for example, you might ask what is uh, an operator in the CFT corresponding to a certain field, for example, some scalar field uh, in the bulk. And uh, if you want to do this in a, some proper way, uh, you have to think about uh, the gauge redundancy that you have in the bulk, which are these uh, different morphisms that uh, you want your observables to be invariant under. So, therefore, you have to prescribe some different morphism invariant relation of how to locate such a bulk field. And one thing which has been discussed in the literature there is to use a geodesic which starts at the boundary and ends at some point in the bulk and you can use the endpoint of this geodesic to specify such a matter field. And then of course you want to know the algebra of these observables that you construct in such a way because they will also determine the ansatz that you want to make for your CFT operators. And in particular we became uh, interested in kind of upgrading these spatial geodesics that we will talk about uh, on the next slides to space-time geodesics uh, precisely because there was this discussion uh, in the ADS-CFT literature on what uh, properties these observables might have. So when we're talking about observables in gravity uh, we generally mean some different morphism invariant relation or prescription uh, and what we want to do is we want to locate some field uh, at some physical point. So uh, an example of this, kind of the most straightforward example, would just be to use, uh, for example, some scalar fields as coordinates. So we can introduce some coordinate system here just on a spatial slice for now with uh, three scalar fields, which are physical matter fields in your theory. And then you can uh, say, well, at least locally this defines a good coordinate system. I want to label my three axes with the three values that the scalar fields take. And then I define an observable as some other field which is located at the point where these scalar fields uh, phi1, phi2, and phi3 take a certain value. Now then if I apply a different morphism, of course, uh, I would move the field around. However, I would also move these scalar fields around, and therefore the prescription of taking this field at the point where the scalar fields take a certain value 
is diffeomorphism invariant. So of course you don't have to use scalar fields, but you can use uh, kind of whatever you want. For example, you could use invariants of your curvature tensor instead of the scalar fields, or do something more elaborate, uh, what we will do in this talk, and we will use uh, geodesics to locate certain physical points. Okay. So let me now describe a construction uh, which we use for these observables. So uh, the idea is that you use some observer, uh, denoted here as observer in this picture on the left, and what he does, he shoots out spatial geodesics. So he has, or he's equipped with some local frame, which is defined only at the point where this observer is in a certain specific way, and he now shoots out a geodesic under some angle here, denoted by theta and phi, and this geodesic will terminate after some geodesic distance r. And at this point, uh, we can now locate a field here denoted by O again for observable. And this uh, prescription is then a diffeomorphism invariant uh, up to some subtleties of diffeomorphisms at this point where the observer is. It's some kind of symmetry of the observer, but that is not uh, important for, for this talk. So then, uh, since this concept of geodesic is kind of diffeomorphism covariant, Again, when we apply a diffeomorphism, this uh, field O, it will be mapped to some other point. However, also the geodesic will be mapped with this diffeomorphism. So the prescription of evaluating this field at the point where this geodesic ends is diffeomorphism covariant. Also, the form of this observer is not really important. Uh, in the paper where this was introduced, uh, which we're going to cite on the next slide, uh, it was taken to be some uh, observer at some central point. However, you could also anchor these geodesics at the boundary of your space-time, for example, on the ADS boundary, and uh, this uh, won't change the main uh, results that we're going to discuss. Now, it is often convenient uh, to go to a different picture. I mean, from we have these observables here, we could now just compute their Poisson brackets, but you could also do this uh, using a gauge fixing, which kind of emulates what you're doing in this construction of the observables. And this gauge fixing is uh, the so-called radial gauge, and uh, kind of doing the same thing as constructing these observables is to demand that the spatial metric has the form depicted on the lower right here. So Q lowercase a b is given by this uh, matrix there. So it has, so these uh, kind of uh, three coordinates, they refer on the one hand to a radial component and the other two to the angular components. So the radial radial component of this metric is fixed to be one and the uh, radial angular components are uh, fixed to be zero. And then the angular angular components uh, here and also in the paper denoted by capital AB, uh, they are free uh, functions. So therefore there are three degrees of freedom in the metric left, these uh, which give you a two metric, uh, this Q capital AB. Now you might ask what is this two metric? Well the two metric is just the metric that you have on a sphere of constant geodesic distance from your observer. So, uh, yeah. so the geometric interpretation now uh, of these uh, coordinates uh, that you have in your gauge fixing is the following. Since the radial radial component of your metric is fixed to be 1, the uh, coordinate distance uh, in these coordinates is just the geodesic distance or the proper distance from your observables. And also the, the angles now retain their meaning. So therefore this uh, gauge fixing just tells you that uh, the labels that you labeled your observables with, that you constructed these, ge these geodesics with, are now just the uh, coordinates that you have. And compactly we can just write this gauge fixing as qr uh, lowercase a equal to delta r lowercase a, uh, so the radial radial is 1 and the radial angular r 0. So given these uh, observables we can now uh, compute their Poisson algebra, uh, which is uh, what we want to do to find out uh, what we need to quantize. Or equivalently, we could also compute their Dirac bracket. This is uh, just the computation, uh, the equivalent computation using this gauge fixing, and we will obtain uh, the same result. So uh, the main result that you find when you look at this Poisson algebra is that you get a certain uh, subalgebra which uh, remains uh, completely local and canonical. And you find that if you take the angular components of the spatial metric Q capital AB and the angular components of its momentum, like the standard momentum that you have in the ADM formalism, capital P, 
And you locate these points by saying, well, they are the endpoints of this GD6 R theta phi and R prime theta prime phi prime. Then you find that these objects keep uh, their canonical Poisson brackets, so they are deltas in the coordinates and they are also deltas in the tensor indices. This is also true for uh, additional matter fields that you have in the theory, so also scalar fields uh, would remain completely canonical and also Poisson commute with this uh, angular components of the metric and its momentum. There are, however, also non-local terms that you get, and these non-local terms are the radial, radial and radial angular components of the momentum, capital P, and their uh, action has been explicitly computed in this paper by Duch, Kaminski, Schwiszewski and Lewandowski, and they have a nice interpretation of acting as certain Lie derivatives in the space of these labels of the geodesics. So intuitively what you can think, the action of this piece, they change the radial, radial and radial angular components of the metric and therefore they actually change how the geodesics run in your space-time. So for example, if they act at the point uh, denoted by this dashed arrow, uh, then what they do is they change the geodesics at this point, they tilt them and therefore they end at a different point and therefore also your observer is evaluated at a different point. So when you now compute the Poisson bracket, you will find that you can write the action of this piece as a Lie derivative in this internal space of these labels R, theta and phi acting on your observer. So it's just the generator of a diffeomorphism in this internal space of uh, uh, geodesic coordinates. This is true for, on the one hand, for this uh, QAB, uh, for, uh, so this piece, they act on this angular components of the metric and its momentum like this, and they also act on any matter field that you have in the theory in exactly this way, so they are just like these diffeomorphisms acting on everything. Now the main point uh, of uh, the paper that was cited uh, on the first slide was now to upgrade this uh, gauge conditions such that we don't uh, only describe spatial GD6, but uh, that these spatial GD6 are also space-time GD6 because this was the construction that uh, people used in the ADS CFD correspondence. In order to do that, uh, you don't only want to impose your condition QRA equal to delta RA, but you also want to impose that the radial radial components of the extrinsic curvature are zero, and then you just find by looking at the geodesic equation for space-time that it is satisfied. Now you go through the same procedure as before, you want to compute the algebra of observables or equivalently you want to compute the Dirac bracket. Now for the Dirac bracket, the first thing you need is the Dirac matrix, so the matrix of uh, constraints and their, or the matrix of Poisson brackets of the constraints and their gauge conditions. So the constraints uh, that you have now, they of course split in your generators of gauge transformations, the Hamiltonian and spatial diffeomorphism constraint, uh, and then also the gauge conditions, so this QRA equal to delta RA and KRR equal to zero that we have up there. And uh, there are each four conditions, so the Dirac matrix that you get on the right here is, uh, is actually a block matrix and each entry here is a four by four matrix. Now the zero in the upper left corner you of course get from the Hamiltonian and spatial diffeomorphism constraints among themselves because they form a closing algebra and therefore on shell they are zero. You get a matrix A, which is invertible by the very definition of uh, this being a gauge fixing for the uh, constraints. And then also you get a matrix B, and this matrix B uh, you get from taking the Poisson bracket of the gauge conditions among themselves. Now in the spatial radial case uh, uh, that we had before, B was zero because the gauge conditions were just this QRA equal to delta RA, and they of course Poisson commute among themselves. However, now B has a non-trivial entry, which you get from uh, the Poisson bracket of QRR minus 1 with uh, KRR. And this is very important, and we will see how it enters on the next slide. The Dirac bracket is now constructed by uh, inverting the uh, Dirac matrix. So we have to compute this uh, uh, inverse of this uh, Poisson bracket matrix. And uh, there's a general formula for computing such an inverse, uh, which is depicted here. So we see that we just get these uh, a to the minus ones on the off diagonals. Uh, we get a zero on the lower right corner, and we get something non-trivial in the upper left corner, 
and this is proportional to a to the minus 1 uh, and b. So if b would be 0, as it was the case for spatial GD6, then this entry in the upper left corner would just uh, be 0. However, here it is uh, not 0. So now to explicitly construct the Dirac bracket, uh, you just uh, take uh, this uh, inverted Dirac matrix and insert it in this standard formula so that the Dirac bracket is just given by the Poisson bracket minus a correction term, uh, which is proportional to this Dirac matrix. And the corrections are then uh, Poisson brackets of the functions that you want to put in the Dirac bracket with the uh, constraints that you have, so the Hamiltonian spatial diffeomorphism and your gauge conditions. So now what you find is uh, when you compute this bracket, uh, you find a generic non-locality uh, essentially everywhere. And as an example, you find it also in uh, your uh, matter fields, for example, here for a scalar field. So when you compute the bracket of a scalar field at r, theta, and phi with a scalar field at r prime and the same theta and phi, you find that this is generically non-zero. And uh, the reason why this is non-zero is uh, exactly this uh, this non-vanishing B matrix that we have uh, in, in this framework here. And again, uh, this B was not present in the case of the spatial GD6. So how does this uh, non-locality come about? So uh, imagine that uh, B would be zero for now. And look, just look at the correction terms that you get for your Dirac bracket. So of course the Poisson bracket between two scalar fields uh, would be zero. And then let's see what corrections we have. Well, if B is zero, then the Dirac matrix has this off-diagonal form. So one of the constraints will always be a gauge condition. Uh, so QRA equal to delta RA or KRR. And the other one will be a Hamiltonian or a spatial diffeomorphism constraint. Now the Poisson bracket of the Hamiltonian or spatial diffeomorphism with the scalar field is not zero. However, the Poisson bracket of the scalar field with the gauge conditions is zero because they are just geometric objects, whereas the scalar field is a matter field and they do not talk to each other in the Poisson bracket. So therefore all your correction terms will vanish, therefore the Dirac bracket would just be the Poisson bracket for these matter fields and therefore they would retain their usual algebra. However now if B is non-zero then you get a contribution to your Dirac bracket where uh, both constraints that you put in the correction term are, can be uh, the Hamiltonian or spatial diffeomorphism constraint and this is exactly uh, what is happening here. And then you just find that you get this uh, non-locality, essentially you get some invertible function from the first a to the minus 1, you get another invertible function from the second a to the minus 1, you get essentially a 1 which is from the b and then this is uh, generically non-zero in the end. And it seems that there is really no way to fix it using some uh, local uh, field redefinitions and therefore it seems that this, uh, this uh, non-locality is really generic and it comes from your use of non-commuting gauge conditions. So let us briefly sum up what uh, we have uh, seen just now. So we've seen that uh, if you have commuting gauge conditions then you in general can find a sufficiently large uh, canonical uh, algebra and uh, this comes uh, just because this B matrix uh, that we have seen is uh, zero and then you can just choose uh, fields which commute with your gauge conditions and they will retain their uh, Poisson algebra or their Dirac bracket will uh, be their Poisson bracket and therefore uh, well, you always find such, such objects and therefore you have this uh, nice set of, uh, of uh, local observables still. However, uh, if your uh, gauge conditions happen to be non-commuting as in the case of space-time GUD6, uh, then you find this uh, generic non-locality in your observable algebra and uh, we don't see uh, a way of uh, how to get rid of it, for example, by uh, local field redefinitions. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your attention.